Did we lose Vietnam? Well, if Vietnam is a police action, it's not really something you win or lose. You're either there keeping the peace or you're not. So it's actually very difficult to explain. But, so then the question I ask, why is it that we all say that we lose Vietnam? You what? Perception. No? Really because we didn't win. It, so it we don't win. Now let me add something else here. Okay. And I've got about 20 minutes. I can do this. We can talk about Watergate. And it's seemingly completely unconnected. And mostly it is. Do you guys remember? And you don't get say it. I think somebody else had a class with. Who's got my uh, film and social history class? Anybody in this one? You do? Okay, so you don't get to say it either. Okay, so how many of you guys remember 2012 election, which was two years ago? 2012 election. The GOP headquarters was bugged by a Democratic community, um, not community, public, uh, political action committee, excuse me, PAC, Democratic PAC. How many of you guys remember that? Do you remember? Do you remember? A little bit. I remember there's a big controversy and they had an eight to the end of it like they do every other thing. Well, but did they? How many, any of you guys else remember? No. I, the fact is, they did. 2012. You look it up, they did. Right? But you don't remember it. Why don't you remember it? And this is not like 40 years ago, right? You guys were in high school. 2012. It's the year before last. N November 2012, right? So, uh, like a year and a half ago. And you don't remember this? Why not? Wasn't big in the headlines. Because the news would be totally less concerned. Couldn't be any less concerned. No news coverage. Wasn't there a Kardashian getting married or something? <laughs> Unfortunately, it could be. Okay. But it's true. Now, why do I mention this? What was Watergate? Why do we call it Watergate? Someone give me some details. It's at the Watergate Hotel. It's at the Watergate Hotel. And Nixon had a habit of reporting everything he liked to do. It has nothing to do with Watergate. And isn't there something about campaign funds being misappropriated? Nothing to do. I mean, that comes out, but that's not really what was the issue. What's the issue? What was at Watergate? Now, if you watch the movie All the President's Men, and it's hysterical to me. I show this in my film with social history class. You watch the trailer for that, you watch the movie, you get this feeling like, people are going to die. The fact of the matter is, a GOP political action committee, okay, and they have the worst name on record, they didn't go by this name, just to let you know, but their acronym, which they did not use, but their name was called the Committee to Re-Elect the President, okay, and the acronym is Creep. They didn't call themselves Creep before. But afterwards, of course, this made perfect headlines. Creep does this, Creep does that. Okay, bad name. Nevertheless, they bug the Democratic headquarters, which is located at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. That's it. Now, we know this, and in our brain, we think, oh, this is the worst thing we've ever seen in our entire life. How could anyone ever do this? Why do we have this in our brain? Do you guys know Woodward and Bernstein? I didn't show you the pictures in my film class, but I can show you the pictures here. If you see the Dustin Hoffman movie, right? Dustin Hoffman and, and um, Rob Redford. Okay, good looking guys, right? This is not... <coughs> sorry. I'm just going to let you know. Neither one of these guys are Dustin Hoffman or Rob Redford, okay? I don't know, maybe you might think they're attractive, but not the same guy, okay? But in the movie, they're these amazingly attractive young guys. And in the movie, they find this tip of the iceberg and they start investigating, investigating. Well, in fact, it's true that Woodward and Bernstein put this on the front page headline for about 18 months. Every single day, there's a new story. 
it doesn't die. Now, when this happens, it happens about October of 72. Okay, does anybody care about it? No, pretty much like nobody really cared when this news broke in 2012. How do we know nobody cared about it? If, it, if they cared about it in October of 72, what would they have done in November of 72? They wouldn't have elected Nixon by a huge landslide. Now, do you think that this bug would have produced any information that would have caused this landslide? Why did Nixon get elected by such a huge margin in 72? It had nothing to do with whatever their creep committee was doing. He was starting to draw down. It was law and order, right? Law and order. This is what gets him elected. The fact that the pr crime rate's going down, the riots are going down, the vast majority of countries support him. It's a huge success. And so they, they couldn't care less about this, except 18 months, uh, one story after another story after another story, they end up creating this character called the Deep Throat, who is supposed to be a big spy within the White House. Now, it's a funny thing, yeah, this is modern history finally coming out. We can find out who Deep Throat is. Does anybody know who he is? I can't remember his name. He died about, I don't know, a year and a half ago. And when he died, they found out who he was. I'm Deep Throat. Okay? He's a guy that was not in the White House. So if Woodward and Bernstein start showing all these stories about exposés of my source, Deep Throat, who's deep within the White House, giving us all these secrets, if it turns out that the guy that they're listening to doesn't work in the White House, what does that mean about the information? Hearsay at best. Hearsay at best. But it's very sensational, and the press is going to love it. And after about a year of this, it gets more attention. About a year and a half, this is what everybody else is talking about. So much so that by 1974, what happens? Richard Nixon. Nixon's Plunker's eyes. Now, again, perception versus reality. Why does he resign? Damning evidence popped up that says he's clearly ordered Creep to do this. True or false? True. Totally false. No connection that shows that Nixon ordered this to happen. When you're talking about the tapes, Nixon liked to record everything. It's true. Unfortunately, what you don't hear is that every president liked to record everything all the way back to Hoover. We've got tapes of FDR of every conversation. So that was just part of policy of being president. So everybody is recording everything. There's 18 minutes missing. Now that seems very deep and conspiracy oriented. Unless you realize out of six years, you're only missing 18 minutes? It's pretty impressive, right? That's a negative assumption. That's no evidence. There's no evidence that says anything. The fact that it's not there doesn't mean that we know that there was something on it and that that damning thing was what we're missing. We have no idea. There's no evidence that he was part of this. And so then the next question. Nixon was about to be impeached, and before the ruling came out, he resigned. True or false? True. Even that you're asking is probably false. False! Okay, now let me... Make sure you understand this, because you can read this and it could be correct. There are committees looking into this scandal, even preparing impeachment processes. And that sounds very, very terrible, right? Okay. Have any of you heard of people wanting to impeach Obama? Oh, yeah. Yes. Anybody have heard actual investigations and wanting to impeach Holder? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now... Has this gone through? Is there any chance of this actually coming to fruition? Probably not, but is there, are there wheels turning? Yes. Now, what would happen if Obama resigned tomorrow? What would happen to all those mechanisms? We would interpret them completely differently, wouldn't we? Today, how do we interpret them? They're silly. Not that they're not... They may or may not have justification, but we don't think of them as any real threat. But if he steps down, what do they all suddenly have? They imply. They imply real threat. And that's very important. They imply. Same thing with Nixon. They don't have any possibility 
of forcing him out. There's no evidence that he's going to actually be forced out. So here's number three. And this is a question. Who forces Nixon out? The Republicans or the Democrats? The head of the GOP, George Bush, the elder. He's the national chairman. He knocks on the door, gives a letter to Nixon saying, you must resign. It's the Republican doing this. Why is the Republican asking Nixon to resign? Say what? They really like Ford? No, they didn't like Ford. <laughs> because why did Nixon get elected? Okay. Where did he get this landslide from? It's based on law and order. That is completely why he wins. And what happens if he gets associated with what seems to be a criminal cover up? And again, in this case, a democracy, do we care if it's true? Or do we care about the perception? Perception, 85%. With this being on the front page for 18 months, this being on the front page for 18 months, the perception is that Nixon has something to do with this. And so the GOP says, in order to save the party, you need to stop. You need to resign. The GOP forces him to resign. Now, and I mentioned this. I used this example in my earlier class. I used this example in the film class. If a priest gets implicated in a sex scandal, whether he did it or not, is this going to take national news? Yes. Oh, absolutely. If sleazy Rick gets involved with a sex scandal, is this going to make national news? No. No. Why? What's the difference? Yes. The priest stands for morality, moral order. They're totally against these things. So if he gets caught up with it, the hypocrisy is so glaring that it creates what we call a scandal. It causes people to question things. What happens when Sleazy Rick does this? Sleazy Rick is sleazy by definition. We fully expect this of Sleazy Rick. doesn't make any news at all. Now, is that right? Are they both the individuals? Maybe it's not right. Is it real? Absolutely it's real. So, in a weird, kind of ironic twist, remember we mentioned about the Democrats. Are they known for being hard on crime? No. So, if they get caught doing this Democratic pact thing. Now, truly, this is exactly the same, by the way, as what happened in Watergate in 2012. But is the media interested in this story? No. Now, there's more than just the fact that the Democrats aren't known for being hard on crime. The role of the press has changed significantly. In 1972, is the press generally supportive of the president? No. A little bit no. Let me rephrase that. In 1976, two years after Watergate, what's the relationship going to be like between the press and any president? More friendly or less friendly? Extremely less friendly. Because what is every new news reporter hoping to be? Scoop. Woodward and Bernstein. The press is able to take down a president. That's power. This will change. In the 1970s, you had three networks. ABC, NBC, CBS. How many television networks do we have today? Can you even count them? All right. I could count them in 1975, right? ABC, CBS, NBC. PBS was only beginning to have a news function. It was mainly for kids, right? Three, that's it. Today, even just the cable news, that's all they do is 100% news, is more than three. There's so many different news outlets. And they're not all even, right? And so what that means is that the voice is different. Oddly enough, the power of the press has been declining. 
And so then you can use it in different ways. You can either use it as a bully pulpit, you can try to be an investigative reporter, or you can try not to. Are the, is the press tending to be more democratic or republican? Uh, opposite of whoever the party. You'd think, but actually is not. But if you look at the mainstream press, more democrat or more republican? By about 90% to 10%. It's, it's overwhelming. Okay. Vastly more democratic. Now, does that mean there aren't Republican reports? Of course there are. Does that not mean that there aren't networks? Fox News is known to be more on the conservative side. Some stations don't try to be one or the other. Some stations deliberately try to be one or the other. The way in which they use the press now is different. And if the press tends to be on the Democratic side, are they going to look at a station like that? No, probably not. That's modern history. I don't want to get too much into this. What I want to emphasize here isn't so much the history or the story of what happened in 2012, but the relevance of what happened in 1972. It wasn't so much that Nixon was caught with his hand in the cookie jar. What made this most significant is that Nixon stepped down. And as soon as he resigns, what happens to all the allegations? Perceived as true. Absolutely. So if I ask you, does Nixon, did, was there evidence that says that he was guilty? Immediately you're going to say, of course. That perception bit. Now let me be even more uh, complex. When does he do this? 74. And so whether you're Republican or Democrat, when the president steps down, what's going to happen to the general mood of the country? Are you elated? No, you're unhappy. Now what if you happen to be, remember we talked about radicals, a radical is against what? Kind of the system. How do they see Watergate? Great. Wonderful news. This is, this is vindication. And I love that word. Whoever said that? It's a perfect word. Vindication. Now, do you think the country is more radical as a result of this? No. But it does cause you to be a little unhappy. Disillusioned. If you're a conservative, what do you say? You're law and order. You really are law and order. What can you do when the president steps down? Can you defend him? Why am I bringing this up? What happens when Vietnam falls in 1975? It really matters that it was 1975. Not 1973, 1975. What's the mood of the country? We look back at what every everything that Nixon did was what? He was involved with campaign stuff, he was involved with this, he was involved with that. Plus, what else did he happen to leave? Now, is there any logical argument here? It's a perception argument. Nevertheless, we see President stepping down in 74. We see North Vietnam taking over South Vietnam in 75. We conflate the two things. Conflate means we kind of combine them together. And today we say, we look at Vietnam, we say, Vietnam, we clearly lost. Vietnam was a disaster. Vietnam was a tragedy. Now remember, what happens if you happen to have been a radical? Where's my radical? What happens if you happen to have been a radical in the 60s? What if you really were against Vietnam? Remember the Vietnam protests? We describe them kind of as protests, right? Let me make sure we get this. When I say Vietnam, frequently you think anti-war, like pacifists. The people that protested the Vietnam War didn't want to get drafted. They were for peace. Peace is something that's going to come out of the 1970s, not the 1960s. And I, I mentioned this before. Why do we know that the radicals are not pacifists? Let me show you the Black Panthers. This is the Black Panther Party. 
They want to create a new country within the United States that only black people can be in. And so this is the Secretary of War. Now we have civil rights, right? Civil rights, one of the civil rights is the Second Amendment, civil right to, to, um, to bear arms. So there's nothing illegal about this. So this guy's got shotgun and he's got, he's got ammunition. And of course these guys make headlines, right? Well, because they're walking around, you know, in military outfits with weapons, and it's perfectly legal. Now keep in mind, this is a tiny, tiny minority, but do you think they're going to get press and headlines? Yes. Are these guys pacifists? No, you don't blow up a building or burn a car or do something if you're pacifist. You could be anti-war. But remember radicalism? Remember? What is radicalism mostly? It's not about race as much as it is about anti-capitalism. Again, this is a minority of people. It's not a majority. It's a minority of people. But if we look at Vietnam, who are we fighting in Vietnam? You know, some people, if you're utterly ignorant, you can say, I don't know who I'm fighting for. Well, okay, you're 16 years old, and you're 1968, maybe you don't know who you're fighting for, because you haven't been educated yet. But anybody who was anywhere around World War II, do you think the parents know what we're fighting for? Do you think they're at all confused about this whole containment concept? No, they're not confused by this. The objectives for most people are pretty clear here. We've got three main objectives. They know this. There's no confusion. They understand containment. Why? Because they understand. Some of them remember Hitler. They remember appeasement. They know very well what this is. But again, you're not talking to somebody who was around in World War II. Certainly not around in the 1930s. You're talking about some kid, 16, 17 years old. So why are we there? Well, we don't know why we're there, right? And so you're thinking, we're there because of capitalism? So why do people hate Jane Fonda? And I shouldn't say, why do people hate Jane Fonda? Like everyone hates Jane Fonda. Everyone hates Jane Fonda. Uh, Vietnam vets aren't real happy with Jane Fonda. John McCain, very famous... POW in Vietnam does not like Jane Fonda. Why doesn't he like Jane Fonda? Okay, sure. Over the other side. This is a picture, you don't see. There's not just one, but a number of pictures, right? So you know how girls and girls would know this. Boys also understand this. So a cute little girl comes up, takes your hat, puts her on, wears it very cute, very nice. Okay. So here she's taking one of the soldiers' hats, she's wearing it out there with the troops. Who are these soldiers? Vietnam. North Vietnamese. She's standing near an aircraft gun, anti-aircraft gun, that shoots down our American planes. McCain was shot down by one of these guns. She's on this gun, big smile. This would be like some cute little starlet today going over to Osama bin Laden and putting on his hat and talking about Osama bin Laden and doing that goofy... What would be the reaction? Now, does she have a right to do this? Well, we're a democratic world, right? Or at least a democratic country. It's not anti-war. What is this? If you're a radical, and you look at the containment, and you realize that the reason why we're doing this is we want to stop the spread of communism, and if you're a radical, and you truly think capitalism is the source of all oppression, and if the communist nations are coming in there, you're thinking the communist nation is democracy. And so who do you root for? North Vietnam. So this is, she's a radical. John, Jane Fonda's right, she kind of admits it. Now she didn't, she apologized for some of the things she said. But this is, if you're a radical, now what I did mention, please don't get me wrong here, not everybody is a radical. It's a very small movement. Do you think this picture, though, doesn't get press when we get it home? Yes, huge, giant, enormous press, right? Because what is she doing? She's on the other side. She's supporting the other side. When we talk about the Democrats being associated not only with 
being kind of radical, but also with kind of an anti-American association, it's because the radicals got associated with the anti-American stuff. Again, radicals are not Democrats. They're protesting against the Democrats. But we're dealing with this association. Well, let's take it one step further. We talk about vindication. When this is all done, and we're looking at Watergate, where's our Watergate? 1975, and South Vietnam falls, and you're kind of a radical, and you think all of this is evidence that there is kind of this big, giant conspiracy. So our view of Vietnam changes significantly, as does our view of Nixon, as does our view of law and order, as does our view of this entire era. 